Um, I have absolutely uh, no paperwork up here to uh, introduce Greg because I know Greg very well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've, I've worked with Greg for a long, long time. Many of you know Greg too. He kind of doesn't even need to have a, uh, an introduction per se, but he was the first procurement executive at the Department of Home, uh, Homeland Security. Prior to that, he was the procurement executive IRS where well, I was the CIO at Treasury and I will, uh, uh, went to Greg as my procurement officer for pretty much any critical program I had because I knew Greg would get it done and I knew he would get it done right and I knew it would be a success. And he came through for me every single time uh, in terms of uh, being a, someone that uh, was a, certainly a go-to person. He now does consulting with a company that he founded, Dever May, and uh, he's, like many of us, still involved in giving back to the community and trying to do what he can to help government and industry work together in what he can to help uh, government and industry be successful and what he can to have his friends in government be successful. So it's, uh, it's always a, a pleasure and an honor to have uh, Greg with us each year. He's been doing this now several years for us. It's a tremendously popular session that we do. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Greg Ruthwell. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. You were always one of the easier guys to work with, and I always appreciated uh, having the chance to, to work with you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to spend the next 75 minutes talking about some of the procurement initiatives at the Department of Homeland Security. We have a tremendous panel, which I'll briefly introduce. Uh, and uh, Let me just start with Dennis Smiley. Dennis is the Executive Director for Enterprise Acquisition and Information Technology. Real simply, that's basically everything that's IT at the department is under Dennis. So that would be Eagle, First Source, uh, several billion dollars worth of work. Uh, uh, is just a, a tremendous executive. Next to Dennis is uh, the person who really needs no introductions, Kevin Boshears. Kevin is uh, probably the preeminent small business representative uh, in, that I've ever met, and I believe in government. Uh, I think DHS is actually going to get its third uh, gold star or A rating from SBA for its program this year, which is three in a row, and a lot of agencies never get one. Uh, Kevin has just been a tremendous uh, advocate for small business. Next to Kevin is Nick Nyack. Nick was here last year, but last year I think he'd only been on board for three or four months, and in that last year that Nick has been here that I've observed, He's done more to advance uh, industry uh, government communications than anyone I've ever seen. So with industry days, personally meeting with companies, uh, just a tremendous leader. Now let me just take a breath. We also have other people in the front row that are tremendously important to DHS procurement and to this whole program. And I believe in this room, you know, the DHS program is about $14 billion. I believe in this room today you have representation from parts of DHS that probably do 95% of that spend. So uh, the lights are a little bright, but let me just ask the following folks to kind of stand up one after another so that we can just kind of recognize you. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Cedric Sims. Uh, do uh, Dr. Sims uh, is the director. <laughs> Dr. Sims is the director of uh, program uh, uh, it's PARM, Program Accountability and Risk Management. Uh, yesterday, Richard Spires mentioned a lot of the programs that Dr. Sims has responsibility for. It's basically every major program, almost 500 programs at DHS. Uh, there's about 130 some that are tier one, tier two, but he has uh, responsibility for those. And I'm gonna ask him a little later in, in the agenda to talk a little bit about his program. We also have uh, Dan Clever here as the deputy CPO. Dan, if you wouldn't mind. Dan is uh, deputy to Nick Nyack. Dan is uh, just a, a, he is the deputy to Nick and has, has made that really tremendously strong one-two team that it takes to run this program. Uh, Letitia Henderson is here from TSA. Letitia is the uh, top procurement person at TSA. Thank you. Uh, after Dominic retired, Letitia is currently acting in that role and is uh, running the TSA program. Uh, William Randolph is here from ICE. He's the top procurement executive at ICE. Uh, I, we also invited Tony Martoccia. I don't know if Tony's arrived yet, but when he does, I will, I will acknowledge him. Uh, Bob Nameco is here from CBP. Bob is the... Uh, 
Bob is the industry liaison from uh, Customs and Border Protection and I believe is doing a tremendous job. Nick will probably talk a little bit about this whole industry liaison concept. Uh, we also have Tim Shaughnessy. Uh, Tim is, uh, Tim is, a, uh, is a, special or a special executive to Nick, handles all sorts of technical matters. Uh, in my day, anytime anything came in that was way beyond my grade level, I'd give it to a guy like Tim and he would come back with the answer. And I imagine Tim's helping out in a lot of ways like that. Uh, we also have uh, Bill Thoreen, who I believe also needs really no introduction. <laughs> Bill is Mr. Eagle 1, 2, and probably Eagle 3. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't uh, slit his wrist first. Uh, and finally, uh, Mui Erkin. I, I don't know where Mui, Mui is, but Mui. Mui at the end. Mui, uh, Mui uh, holds a very special place in my heart. He was uh, with me at the IRS, was one of the first people that came over to DHS, uh, and has been a real advocate for industry communications. And, and coincidentally, I believe this is his last year in DHS and last year in government. And so I, certainly we all wish you well, Mui. The format today is going to be real simple. We're going to start. Dennis is going to talk a little bit, then Kevin, then Nick. I have some questions. <coughs> I'm going to ask some questions of our panel. But I also have a question to ask of Cedric, Leticia, uh, and, and Will, and Bob Nameco. So uh, I've got a few questions that, I, you know, that have kind of seemed to be the prevalent things that are on people's minds. And before we take any more time, let me just turn to Dennis and Dennis ask you to uh, start us off. I can do that. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's great to see such a turnout. I mean, but these lights are just blinding, so I really can't see you. And that might be a good thing from a podium aspect. Mm -hmm. I had the great honor this afternoon to discuss OPO, which is the Office of Procurement Operations. Dan McLaughlin is the Executive Director of the Office of Procurement Operations. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, but I am going to take that honor and introduce Office of Procurement Operations. I'll go through a couple slides, and I'll try to keep it brief, but we're so proud of the organization, it's hard to keep it brief at times. So if I get tangled up on something, just bear with me just a little bit. I have no good jokes, but I can tell you this, there'll be a test at the end, so pay attention. So without further ado, let me just tell you, I mean, about OPO operations. We were established in 2003. And the reason we were established is because of, we, we formulated after 9-11, and everybody knows about 9-11, we formulated DHS, 22 components, 23 components into one organization. Really large. Only seven of those had a full performance of operations and contracting. So what we did is we picked up the other 16, 17 components in order to do their operations. And up here is the, the components right now that we support in the Office of Procurement Operations. We're really proud of what we do, what we've established. We have quality people. We have a dynamic, dynamic team. And we do that with our components. That's what makes us so great with the organization. We were with our components, we work well with our customers, and we work well with our CIO community and PARM, which is sitting in the front row, to make sure quality products are going out the door, as well as communicating with industry. So just a, a quick thing of the customers, a lot of them, a lot of them. So here's the organization, sorry about the slide. Little bit convoluted, but I wanted to let you know where we fit and how it is. There's 13 operating organizations. We have a grants organization that we're very proud of. We're very self-sufficient, which is nice. We support, in these operating div divisions, a lot of dollars, which I'll show you in a minute, across the organization and spend across the organization. So what I want you to take away from this slide, though, is we're divided up by the customer. We are customer-centric, so each director, whether it's science and technology, whether it's information technology acquisition center, we're divided by the customer, so we've got a customer base that we support, and we're directly liaised on with that customer. And we're a direct report. I mean, we're one of the direct reports to Dr. Nick Nyack. So we're in the same building, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, you know, but we work well together. And, and that's the message I really want to send. Here's the big message. The big message is what we do across the organization. 
Across this organization in FY10, you can see our spend 17,000, over 17,000 different procurement actions. Those are only obligated dollars. I have to tell you, it's, it's obligated dollars and the team works really, really hard to make sure those are obligated in a timely manner. 5.4 billion, 5.2 billion, 17,000 actions. And you can see from this chart that not only does the continuing resolution affect industry, <laughs> it affects us because you can see the spikes with, it, with seven continuing resolutions. Hopefully, hopefully we're, we'll get away from the spike of doing September as the main focus of, of, our, of our work. So that's, that's our spend across the organization, and it's large. It ranges anywhere from IT services, IT commodities, to, to buys for staffing, engineer services, CETA requirements across the organization. A really large, large buying. Our initiatives across the organization, and I hope I'm not fading out, uh, they put me behind the podium because I talk with my hands, so they, they knew I'd have to relax on the podium. But our initiatives, and, and this was mentioned, Greg mentioned it in the beginning, and this is Dr. Nick Nyack's number one charge to us to say, hey, open, open communication with industry. We believe, we believe in OPO and across the organization that we're doing really, really extremely well in this. We try to make sure that we liaison before a procurement action goes out, while a procurement action is out. And what we try to do is to bring industry into the room. We want industry in the room with us. There's requirements that we have and we're not sure how to get there. We know what we want, but we're not sure of the total requirement. So we're trying to bring you up front now versus just sticking out an RFI or a draft RFP and say, okay, let's discuss this. We want to do more and more of the one-on-ones. We want to do more of the industry days. So as the RFI goes out and we ask for, you know, industry day or we ask for input, we're asking for a lot more. We're asking for a lot more. I mean, what a, if you would, just, just for a second, I mean, when we send out an RFI, we're asking for information, especially if it has information in there that we're requesting, please come to the table and tell us. If we send out a draft RFP and you're looking at that draft RFP and you're saying, whoa, there's no way I can do this firm fixed price, tell us that. Tell us and then tell us the reason why. Because we need to know, because the shift is moving from high risk contracts down to firm fixed price, it has an impact on all of us. To, to include our industry partners. So tell us those things. If you see something like that, let us know. Let us get to the table with you and discuss it. We might have overlooked it. We might not have seen it. And, and we want to be open and we want to be honest about these things. So the next one is to recruit and retain highly qualified people. We're extremely proud of this. We recruit and, and ret highly qualified individuals not only within the organization, but outside the organization. Unfortunately, in a beltway, we always rob Peter to pay Paul. I mean, you know, so we're good between organizations, the DOD's fighting with us, we're fighting with each other, and then, but what we offer in OPO, which is really great, with the organizations that I showed you earlier on the chart, which is really great in OPO, is we offer the opportunity, if somebody is doing s and and they're doing R&D research and development, they want to move over to inf information technology requirements, they have that ability to do it with an OPO and be trained in that. So we offer that. We offer the training to individuals. We offer an acquisition uh, development program for, I still call them in interns, but it's acquisitional professional, APCP, and I forget the, <laughs> it's terrible. I still call them interns, You're getting in a lot of trouble for calling them interns. But we, we offer those and we promote from within. So we try real hard to say if there's something out there, let's promote from within. We got quality people, so we, we try real hard to promote from within. Achieve acquisition savings. We do that greatly through, through our vehicles. And I have to say some of the vehicles that are out there, everyone's aware of Eagle, Every, IT services. Everyone should be aware of First Source, which is IT commodities. And I'll discuss a little, little more later on about Eagle 2 and First Source 2. But in Eagle, over 640 orders on Eagle so far 
with 11.5 million in, in spend. So that's really, you know, I should say billion, I mean, you know, in spend, I mean, but back up on that, 11.5 billion in spend. The first source, 18,000 task orders, delivery orders under first source with a $2 million, $2 billion. I keep saying million, but it's $2 billion spend. Extremely, extremely proud. I called them the starship, but I was reminded they're the flagship, only because I guess we're in DOD somewhat. Starship because I'm a Trekkie. I mean, you know, so it was like, hey, starship sounded really good because it's impressive. So, uh, and, and another one we're really proud of is PAX. PAX, so far we had 115 orders with, a, with the $704 million spend over the life of that, and that is million, I mean, so. But we're, we're extremely proud, and it's, it's one that is a completely service-disabled, veteran-owned set-aside. And we, we've made great accomplishments in, in that area that we were, we were short in. So we're, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, and on that first bullet with open communication leads to the last bullet on this page. With your help, we develop acquisition strategies. Not everything fits, it's one size fits all. So on that, we can determine from there, are we going open, full and open competition from that acquisition strategy? Or is this truly a small business set aside? We need that help. I mean, you know, our, our contracting professionals, believe me, have no problem making those decisions because it, it rests in their hands when we, when we formulate the acquisition strategy. But that really assists when, when we go into it. We, we got a 76% rate last year for full and open competition. And that is great on obligated dollars. I showed you the obligated dollars. 76% of that is, you know, full and open competition. So we do promote full and open competition constantly. Now, let me tell you some of the procurements that you're probably interested in right now is Eagle 2, and here's your test. Eagle 2 has been awarded, so you should have received your notice by now. It's about two weeks ago. So, yeah. Okay, so you got it. I mean, you know, so Eagle 2 hasn't been awarded, all right? But, uh, but I had to keep you to make sure you was awake this afternoon. I mean, so. So Eagle 2, let me tell you what's going on with Eagle 2. Eagle 2, we're in the middle, well, we're close to the end of the process, really, of the proposal evaluations. We've put out the dates, you know, the, hopefully by, you know, the end of April to get these things awarded. There, there's a lot of proposals that come in. So I talked to Nick the other day, and we looked at a, a philosophy of, there's, there's three functional categories, there's different areas that we need to look at with, this, with the unrestricted track and the small business side. If there is the possibility of awarding one, one functional category early, we will do that. We will do that, and we're looking at IVMV right now because we're real close to finishing up all that stuff. So, versus holding everything until, say, hey, we, we're complete. So we're looking at those, those areas to streamline, to, to get things out. So the others will follow. Functional category two and functional category one will follow. So don't get excited when you see something coming out and say, wow, they awarded functional category three. What, what happened to one and two? Uh, first source two, as you well know, proposals close on March 6th. We, uh, because of the success of these programs, they're alive, they're well. The department has adopted them. They are using them across the organization, and that's how we get our spend because our components partner with us so well. That's how we get to spend from these, these various programs that we put out. We, we couldn't do it without the components and without the community. Uh, TABS, can't say much on that because I'm the SSA, so I'm not going to you know, talk about it. But TABS, uh, we're looking at, there, there's three domains on TABS, and there's seven tracks. And we're looking at the first three domains to award those by the end of April, and those will be all in the small business arena, and the rest of them no later than November. Now, I can tell you this, we're pushing the schedule forward, so it'll probably be a lot quicker than November, but I won't publish that until we're ready to publish it, so, but, but we're working on that. Falcon, here's the one that's really probably the hardest one to describe because as my boss said, Falcon, I was like, well, what is it? 
So my boss, Dan McLaughlin, said, now it's a flock of birds. So, and the reason he said that is because it's real simple. Falcon is really now a, a whole conglomerate of various procurements. It's not one procurement. It's a title given to a portfolio of procurements. What we are going to do in the first one out will be wireless, but what we are going to do is we're working with our program office now. We are going to publish a federal business opportunities notice to let you know what these are, because some of them are IT governance, IT security, and, and, and the list is pretty extensive. And if I get into all of them, it's going to be like, well, when does networks come out, or this is a service. We're going to publish them, and hopefully what we will do, we'll keep you abreast as these move forward. But what I said is wireless will be the first one, and that will be under GSA schedule. So that's the update on the major ones. Let me give you just a brief synopsis of what's, what's going on. And from my understanding, I think all these slides will be posted on, on, a, on a website. So hope you, you, you'll be able to get them because on these next slides, it's, it's kind of convoluted when you go through them and try to figure out what's really coming up. But I wanted to let you know the opportunity and some of the opportunities coming up. I'm not going to sit and read them all to you, but DHS employee sh shuttle service, we plan on releasing, you know, June 2012 is the anticipated date of it, okay? And, and, and again, strategy to be determined. I mean, you know, so we're still working on the acquisition strategy. It, it, again, we need your help on these things. Advanced handheld devices, released around uh, 2012, protective uh, security officer, 8A set aside, and please pay attention to some of these because it's an 8A <coughs> set aside, released in March, which is next month. And, and I'm going to go through them rather quickly. Again, they'll be posted. I mean, I'm, uh, I promised Kevin I'd let him speak today. So, I mean, I've got to get through these a little quicker. I mean, so. Uh, integrated Cybersecurity Education. This is a grant program. Again, like I told you in the beginning, we have a grants program. We're very proud of that grants program. So it's a grant. The BioWatch CETA, most of you are familiar. We, we posted the last questions and answers. They're out there for review. And we plan on releasing the, the RFP in, in March. HISN, you know, it's always nice to do these acronyms. We, we, we're famous for acronyms. So Homeland Security, uh, uh, man, huh? Information Network, yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say Integrity Network. Thank you, Wade, yeah. So single award IDIQ contract is what we're planning. Hub zone set aside, release in July. Mission support, which is with national protection. IDIQ contract is what we're looking at for that particular thing. Uh, released June 2012. That's, that's been out there for a while, so most of you might be uh, aware of it. Also in 2012, the long range broad agency announcement, which has already been out in the F FBO, the Federal Business Opportunities. January 26th, so take a look at that. I mentioned uh, Falcon, which is, you know, a portfolio. Cellular Wireless is the first one out of block. So again, that'll be on GSA schedule and released in May 2012. Uh, the other ones, National Information Exchange Program, released May 2012, optical and non-optical card assumables, uh, released in April 2012. Again, what I, what I would say, if there's some small businesses in the room that haven't done business with, with DHS, we always try to get things, or other businesses, you know I mean, things to remember. Federal business opportunities is our government point of entry. So please pay attention to the federal business opportunities and take a look at them, if not weekly, daily. I mean, you know, make an effort to take a look what's out there. If you have questions or something comes up, a CO is posted, please call that CO and ask your question. We encourage you to ask questions, so please call and ask that question. The other one is that's not on here is one that you've got to remember is uh, uh, the Commerce Business Daily, not the Commerce Business Daily, I mean, that's Federal Business Opportunities, but, you know, uh, the, the people in contact, these are the ones that you should be contacting an OPO, Office of Procurement Operations, if you need to get in touch. 
It's very important. Kevin or talk a lot about small business, but Faye Jones is our small business specialist, exceptional person. She will help you through any small business area or arena that you got along with Will Thomas. They are two individuals that you really, really need to take a look at when, you're, when you want to come into office procurement operations dealing with small business side of house. The other ones that you need to be aware of is our industry liaisons, which were established just recently. We have them in every DHS component. If you go out to dhs.gov, you can click on a component, you can surf through. It's easier to go up into the little search block and say industry liaison, and it takes you right into them versus trying to surf around dhs.gov. There's a lot of information in dhs.gov. Type it into the search. And then uh, William Thoreen and Ian Washington, Bill handles, he was introduced earlier, Bill handles the IT side of the house, and Ian Washington will answer any non-IT questions that you need. Thank you. Dennis, thank you. Kevin, uh, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, everyone. I happened to look at the calendar this morning and I noted you know, leap year, February 29th. But I also looked ahead till tomorrow and tomorrow's March the 1st. And it just so happens that tomorrow the Department of Homeland Security is nine years old, officially. March 1, 2003. I could probably talk about that the rest of the day. But uh, let it suffice to say, boy, it's been a journey. Well, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, and I thank Jim Flysick and Greg Rothwell for coordinating my participation like they typically do. And we customarily have a few conversations before we get to come and visit with you and, and do this. And the typical question is for me, well, what do you want me to talk about? And the, the typical answer I get is, well, you know, Kevin, just that small business stuff you do. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so, what, but one, one part of my thoughts for you today are, is um, a lot of people ask us, well, how, how are you able to incorporate the small business program, you know, as part of supporting your mission and part of what you do? And uh, I'll answer that. And then I'll tell you a few things that you can count on us to continue. And then a couple of thoughts about what's new like a couple of things that are just really scorching hot that all of the small businesses with us today and all size businesses for that matter really need to know about. Um, one thing that we've done since the beginning is that we've, made, we've really made an effort, a sincere thoughtful effort to make small business participation part of the acquisition process. Not an afterthought, not the only thought, but part of the process. And the accomplishments and the work that the small business community has done for us um, speaks volumes. So it's really a tribute to something old fashioned. Um, on my side of the fence, we spend a great deal of time on helping to create the opportunities. And the small business community, to their credit, they've met us in the middle by bringing the best they have to offer and taking advantage of the opportunities. The evidence is everywhere, including in this room today. Okay, so some things you can count on, absolutely count on, to continue to see. For the small business community, we'll continue to have both prime and subcontracting opportunities. At DHS, we're going to continue to use a variety of contract vehicles you'll continue to see DHS-wide contracts, like my colleague Dennis mentioned a moment ago. We'll continue to use the GSA schedule. We'll continue to use FedBizOps and open market buying. And 
you'll continue to see us use the flexibility that's needed in using all of those approaches. And finally, one other thing you can continue to expect to see is that at DHS, we're going to continue to support all of the small business programs. And that's a lot easier said than done. But because of the commitment of our senior leadership uh, in the acquisition field, the components, the HCAs, the small business specialists, the industry liaisons, these are our program management team. Um, they really have developed an understanding of what we're trying to do. And what I've found in my experience over the years, more experience, my hair was not this gray when I started. It absolutely was not. Some of you, some of you have told, I, I've, I've told this elsewhere, I'll tell it quickly. My son was doing a school project. He's 13. And he Googled me. And he called me into his room to see his computer. And he said, hey, Dad, come here. I Googled you. You need to see something. I go, what? He goes, look at that, Dad. You need a new photo. He's, he said, my son, this is, my, well, you know, your kids, they just tell you what you think. And he said, Dad, your hair hasn't been that color as long as I've known you. <laughs> so such that it is. Yeah, so, no, but that's important. That's, that, it's so important that, that people in the industry understand that we're going to support all of the small business programs. That means we're going to use one program on one project and another program on another project. And, and, and it's all driven by market research. Okay, now a couple of things on what's new. Now, folks, this is like direct impact stuff. So you got to know this. And you got to know this cold. Okay, number one, new authority. It's in the FAR. For the first time in the history of the GSA schedule program, the federal government, DHS included, we have the authority to do formal set asides on the GSA schedule. Look it up. It appeared, the FAR was amended November 2nd. That, that, that's having a ripple effect around the government. We've used the GSA schedule for many, many years. But this is a new authority that the government has, DHS included. Okay, the second one, um, this, this impacts small businesses and any large business that has a subcontracting plan. A, a key segment of the small business size standards has been changed. It appeared in the Federal Register on February 10th, and it goes into effect on March the 12th. It's the 54 series. Now, some of it's pretty dramatic. Like to, to the small businesses with us today, here's an illustration. Everyone knows what NAICS cards are and how it works, and that's how your size goes, right? One of the most commonly used small business NAICS codes is 541-611. The current size standard is 7 million, if you look it up today. The amendment causes it to jump to 14. It's a big change. And that it also impacts large businesses because you have to ask for company sizes, you know, when you're doing a subcontract. So make note of that. Uh, it'll impact many of us today. Okay, now another, another area that has gotten a lot of interest lately, a lot of people have asked me about it, and it's called, uh, commonly referred to as the mid-tier issue. Has it, has it, is everyone vaguely acquainted with that? Let me see your hands. Okay, what's called the mid-tier issue? Okay. Let me share with you just a couple of observations, and then uh, uh, I'll turn it back over to Greg. Um, there's been uh, a, a, a number of businesses have contacted me about it, uh, a number of uh, trade associations. There's uh, some congressional uh, interest that's been expressed. And um, here are just a couple of observations. One is there's really no formal definition for what we call mid-tier. Uh, most of the time what I've seen 
is that it's, it's small businesses that have outgrown their revenue-based size standard. Like, for example, the current or soon to be, the IT small business size standard for most of them is going to go from 25 to 25.5, you know, with this amendment I just mentioned. Anyway, it's typically, it, it, for example, it's a firm that's over that in revenue. So now, based on the current standards and current set of rules, they would then, from this point forward, have to compete against firms that are substantially larger. So the discussion point has been, well, should we have some sort of program for firms that find themselves in this predicament? Um, so there's been a lot of discussion. There will be more discussion. I, I think in the, uh, I started to write it down from my calendar, but in a two month, a two month period, I got 15 phone calls on this issue. And when, if I just get one or two calls about something, I just try to answer it and you know, go on to the next one. But when there were all these many calls, you know, back to back to back to back, it, um, you know, it constitutes a pattern for me. So a couple of observations. This seems to only happen to in industries in which there's a revenue-based size standard. So that's kind of a clue. You know, like if we're gonna create such a program, like what should it look like and how should it work? Should it fit within the framework of SBA's current guidelines? Uh, one thing is crystal clear, no matter what the ultimate outcome is, is that you have to find a way to protect the current small business programs because that's how these companies got where they were, got where they are today. So, I mean, that becomes clear as you begin to talk to companies. Anyway, though, so stay tuned. I'm sure there's going to be more uh, discussions, more forums, more, uh, more interest in this as we um, go forward from here. Okay, and then um, last thing. Um, some of you have heard me say this before, but I try to take the opportunity to say this. Um, even though I'm the small business advocate, when you, when you look at the array of work that needs to be done at DHS, we really do need all size businesses to help us meet the mission. And for those small businesses that are listening today, it continues to be my honor to serve as your advocate. Thank you. It's my pleasure uh, to have Dr. Nyack speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're going to move to a little bit of a fast finish because I want to make sure you guys have an opportunity to ask all the questions you want. Yeah. Uh, nothing like being interrupted right in the beginning. <laughs> Mui, thanks. And Mui, can you get a microphone set up for the uh, front row? Okay, so we can do that. That's great. So the first thing I want to do is I always do when I address industries, I want to thank you, everybody in industry. I want to thank you for everything that you've done in the uh, very close to nine years that DHS has uh, been in, his, in existence. And for those of you who are in, interested in connecting with us and doing business with us, thank you. Hang in there. Um, I appreciate your interest. Everything that we do, you know, in DHS is essentially some of our people and a contractor. And if you look at our budget, it's split right down uh, the middle. Half of it is, uh, goes to our personnel, about 240,000 employees, and another half is uh, in contract support. And when you go anywhere and you see how we're actually protecting the country together, you will see a little bit of contractor and a little bit of government. So it's important that we continuously have these forums to chat so that you're as well informed as we are. So I'm pleased to be here, and again, thank you. Uh, for everything that you've done. I also want to thank the, the crew that has come with uh, me today. I want to thank Dennis and uh, Kevin, obviously. I also want to thank Bill, Th I'm just going to go over the list here that uh, Greg went just to uh, emphasize a few points. Bill Thoreen, who's one of the, the best contracting officers, if not the best that we have in DHS. Tim Shaughnessy is my senior technical advisor. Bob Nameco is one of our procurement liaisons. I'll talk about that in a second. Dr. Cedric Sims is uh, doing some cutting edge work in terms of program oversight over the 500 programs in DHS. Dan Clever, my deputy, 
and a couple of our heads of contracting, Letitia and uh, Will, and then at the end, uh, Mui Irkin, and, and again, yeah, it is Mui's last year, and we're grateful for everything that Mui has done. There's three things that I want to quickly cover. One, some observations. I've been here for 14 months now, observations about the current acquisition environment. A little on my priorities as Chief Procurement Officer, overseeing $14 billion a year. And then we're going to share some status, the status of some large procurement. So we, uh, it was very good. Dennis went over the Office of Procurement Operations, which is about $5 billion of the $14 billion in some of the procurements that are out there right now. But there's a lot more. Uh, and we couldn't have every head of contracting come up here, so I'm going to fill that gap and, and uh, get you up to date on some of that. Mui, can we get to the org chart? Is there the org chart in the deck? Yeah, if you could just get to the org chart, if you haven't. Okay, that's good, yeah. The, the org chart, thank you. Yeah, I just want everybody here, because there may be some businesses who are not familiar with DHS and our acquisition organizational structure. I want you to visually see what it looks like. So a couple of points I want to bring to your attention. There is something called the Chief Acquisition Officer. It is uh, usually a political appointee and a DHS. That is Rafael Boras, who is the Undersecretary for Management. Above Rafael is obviously the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary. Acquisition is then carried out uh, or overseen uh, in the department uh, in two ways. One, me, the Chief Procurement Officer, over 1,453 contracting people, 100,000 actions, $14 billion. That actually happens in nine contracting offices. There's a little number over every contracting office. There are two that are in blue that directly report to me. There's seven that are embedded in the components. They, while they don't directly report to me, it's the next best thing. Uh, we are very, very closely aligned. As you can see, we have a couple of heads of contracting who have come out today to chat with me. The purple box is uh, Dr. Cedric Sims and the, the Office of Program Accountability and Risk Management, sort of newly created and defined and reimagined by Dr. Sims. And that's the arm that oversees the 500 program so that we can ensure that programs are accountable and also measure risk. Because as you guys know, I'm not going to get out in front of the budget, but you know what the environment is. And we're in a, a different era in DHS where we're going to have to start to make trade-off decisions on programs. In order to make trade-off decisions, you have to be informed. And Dr. Sims is doing some very cutting edge work there. So that's a little bit about us organizationally. Back to the three things I wanted to share with you. In the current acquisition environment, contract spending is going, to is going to hold steady at about $14 billion. It did last year. It has for the last four years. I predict that it will again this year. The spread of business, and I appreciate Kevin's passion, uh, my passion, all of our passion in small business. It is very interesting. There was a third party that did a study on the DHS spend over the last couple, two, three years, and it indicated that 40% of our business, it's, we knew this anyway, 40% of our business is with large business, 30 is with medium, and you can loosely define medium, uh, and 30% we actually have a negotiate. It's roughly 30% with small business. And then there are all the socioeconomic categories, as, as Greg had alluded to. Uh, we're very proud that we have earned an A for the last two years on the small business scorecard. We think we're going to get an A for uh, last year, and I think we're going to be headed for an A this year. But to Kevin's point, we need every business to be interested in doing business with DHS. So my bottom line on the current acquisition environment, there's lots of opportunities for all sizes of business. We're in an era of basically no increased funding. So uh, we're going to have to make trade-off decisions over time after being informed uh, with the proper tools that Dr. Sims has actually put in place. It's kind of an exciting era and still a lot on the table um, for all businesses. My priorities, they, I have four priorities that uh, I'm driving. One is to continue to build and sustain our contracting workforce of 1,453 people. Uh, and also affect the rest of the acquisition workforce uh, to the maximum extent I can, program managers and these contracting officers, technical representatives. Uh, achieve contract savings where we can, so things that are on my radar are maximizing competition. 60% of our spend was competed last year. We've got a goal of roughly 70%. Maximizing strategic sourcing or bringing things together as much as we possibly can. Employing reverse auctions, but only where applicable. Uh, 
uh, the important point to make, and then maximizing the use, use of electronic capability, a, a receipt of electronic proposals, as well as electronic catalogs so that I can speed getting things to our customers who are actually protecting the country. The third thing is to continue to evolve our program oversight, uh, and probably a, a better speaker uh, holistically about program oversight would be Dr. Sims. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we've got 500 programs. Today we have better insight into all of those programs than we ever had before. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, and, and these are in no order, all of them are of equal significance to me, is open communication with industry. And uh, so some of the things that we've been able to drive over the last 14 months with all of these wonderful people, are a new advanced procurement forecast system. It's not perfect. It is better than what we had uh, last time. We're going to continuously evolve it. What would it look like if it was actually perfect? And Okay, and mui has got a screenshot uh, up on the screen now of what it looks like if you actually went to the website. It would be, you know, if you went there and you were interested in a procurement opportunity, you really got an update. Um, and then that would be available to all businesses. That, to me, is a fair, fair playing field. Um, but because that is a little bit challenging right now, and it, it's always challenging to get information into systems, I created these procurement liaisons. So there's a procurement liaison, or I, they're kind of like a mini MUI. I have MUI at DHS, <laughs> and now we have a mini MUI. And one mini MUI who's here is Bob Nameco from CBP. And the idea for you guys is that as you go to APFS and you look at the information, if you have a question first, I, well, it, you could go to the point of contact who's listed in APFS, but if you don't get an answer, I wanted somebody else who was close to the action. So I created these procurement liaisons. I'm very interested to get feedback from you guys on APFS. You can do it at the APFS website. Please don't be afraid. Um, tell us how it's working for you. And I'm also interested in getting feedback about our, the effectiveness of our procurement liaisons. We just started it. Uh, but again, my hope is that we just simply talk to you guys and answer questions as you go through the difficult process of determining what you can bid on uh, and also, you know, the, we're trying to reduce the, the bidding burden on you guys. The other thing we did was we, we revamped our annual DHS Industry Day. Uh, almost all the feedback was extremely positive, and we did that actually with your feedback from the previous uh, industry day. We now have over 100 small business events that Kevin's folks uh, uh, manage. We have increased the number of, and, and by the way, not any one of these things makes us uh, really answer the mail, but it's all stuff that's moving in the right direction. Increased RFIs, draft RFPs, industry days for specific procurements based on my new vendor engagement plan. We issued a new debriefing guide for all contracting officers. We issued guidance to contracting officers about providing industry appropriate time around uh, proposal preparation around holidays. We issued guidance on uh, procurement specific industry days and uh, the, the fact that we don't want contracting officers holding industry days and not allowing interaction. So uh, that was another thing that we did. I've instituted an open door policy myself. As busy as all of our schedules are, that's not an excuse to not have an open door policy. Usually I have Fridays and, and many of you oblige, have obliged, so I appreciate you also taking time on your Fridays. My, my attendance and all of these wonderful folks' attendance at uh, events like this, our collective support for the OMB Mythbusters 1 and the input that we're providing on Mythbusters 2. And really and finally, you know, the most important thing when you're trying to drive cultural change is leadership message. So it's constantly talking about across the enterprise and to our people who actually carry things out that we want open communication with industry. And over time, it will happen. I'm very confident about it. This will continue to be a priority of mine. My ultimate responsibility uh, at the department is to ensure that we're getting a good deal while buying things that meet the mission. And I kind of have a formula, and if you ever want to know what I'm doing, I'm always working something under these variables in the formula. And the formula is basically, and we don't have the sl slide for the formula, so here it is. Hiring qualified contracting professionals and, ac and others in the acquisition workforce, plus training them to be the best in class, plus strategic sourcing wherever appropriate, plus fostering an acquisition process that, enge that encourages early engagement with industry to establish clear requirements and also reduces the burden to bid, plus maximizing competition, 
plus selecting the appropriate contract type for the, for the specific work required, plus applying strong program management and contract management throughout the life of our programs and contracts. That's kind of the formula that I have to follow, and I have to always be vigilant about doing things and pushing things that support uh, all of those variables to be moving in the right direction. And so with that, I'm going to ask, and we do have quite a few uh, upcoming procurement opportunities or, or opportunities that are uh, in process, and we want to give you a status update. I'm going to ask Tim to go ahead and uh, cover those. So if we could get a microphone to Tim. Tim Shaughnessy will give us an update on those. Yeah, Tim, Tim, can, can you come up here? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, listening, and I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Thanks, Nick, for uh, speed reading through your part and uh, giving me a few minutes here. And I will make it brief. Uh, but what we wanted to do, Nick did mention to you, um, one of the things we're trying to do is really, uh, as part of our uh, headquarters activities, really have line of sight and through a lot of things, a lot of metrics, and as, as well as some of the procurements. And uh, Nick mentioned our uh, advanced uh, procurement uh, forecast system, as well as an internal tool we're using to uh, get a little line of sight within the components in terms of some major acquisitions. And, and certainly, it's just a snapshot of, of, of many of that we have in the portfolio. But um, and I will certainly direct you as we go through these to um, uh, to actually uh, reach out, as Nick mentioned, to our HCAs and to our industry liaisons within within the components for uh, information. They will certainly guide you as to what they can discuss with you, push, uh, pushing uh, the maximum extent practical in terms of uh, that discussion, and then also trying to keep uh, you abreast of status. But just quickly, um, what you'll have with your charts that you'll take away, we've got uh, 14 acquisitions from five of our components. Those 14 acquisitions are largely uh, IT, obviously, centric and um, are in various states of, uh, of the acquisition process. For uh, CBP, uh, can you just? It's, it's down there. You got, okay, okay, you got okay. For CBP, we've got uh, 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 four acquisitions outlined. Uh, ACE, uh, our BEMS, uh, our, um, also our uh, PSPO software development, and our integrated logistics support field technology. I just want to highlight a couple things. Um, you'll see in the, uh, in what we've tried to do is give you sort of a, a schedule and, and upcoming events and, and st status. Uh, on, on the uh, ACE program, you'll see there uh, we're, we're actually, um, the acquisition strategy for this includes multiple awards for modular development capability, a theme you've been you've been hearing uh, this week here certainly, and uh, that is uh, scheduled for uh, RFP release uh, in in March, a competitive IDIQ requirement with the late fiscal year 2012 award. Another one I wanted to highlight for CBP is the um, is the uh, software development enhancement modernization. That's a requirement that really supports the passenger systems program office current supports under two existing bridge contracts with Barton Associates and CSC. It's a new requirement plan for full and open competition. Uh, RFP release coming up uh, as well in March with the late uh, 2012 award. Uh, moving on to ICE, and Will is here, and, uh, and certainly um, if you have uh, further questions, follow up uh, with the particular contracting officers assigned. But uh, three major programs here, uh, certainly one is the, uh, uh, the information systems uh, security officer support. That's uh, going to be an RFP issued in that in the third quarter of 2012. Uh, acquisition strategy is currently being developed there. Uh, the incumbent contractor is uh, Knowledge Consulting Group. Uh, the requirements in architecture design, software design development uh, is, a, uh, is a, uh, a very interesting program. Uh, they've held an industry day in, in December on that. It's a new requirement. There's no uh, incumbent contractor. Uh, small business set aside with multiple award IDIQ is under consideration there with an RFP issuance in April. And CVIS too, a very, uh, uh, I think, interesting uh, acquisition approach for those that may be familiar with it, uh, sort of a two-step uh, phase pre-solicitation process. Uh, what uh, Will and his folks have done is they uh, engaged an industry with two RFIs. They went through a phase one advisory request for white papers around their uh, technical solutions and capabilities. Phase two is a, a full technical cost proposal uh, uh, offering, and, uh, and they plan to issue an award with uh, one year and two one-year options uh, in August 2012 there. In TSA, we have two, uh, Leticia's here, we have two um, programs, the AIT, ATR program that uh, is ongoing, uh, projected for a third quarter 2012 award. 
Uh, that's uh, incumbent contractors or L3 and rapid scan. Uh, there we're looking at competition being limited to the multiple existing award uh, holders that are certified with the ATR capabilities there. And another one that you uh, may be familiar with, TTAC Tim, award pending there, probably uh, near term. Uh, that was uh, released in, in, uh, with a five-year ordering period and with uh, full, under full and open competition in, in uh, March, and we're getting ready to wrap that up. And then uh, just uh, a couple for uh, Coast Guard, one for Coast Guard that I just wanted to highlight out of the two, Claire Grady, our, uh, our head of contracting activity there. They've got a, uh, uh, Dennis talked to you a little bit about uh, our, uh, our TABS requirement. On the IT hardware side, they've got an IT hardware equipment program by. Uh, for award again in the fourth quarter 2012. This is uh, uh, a, a follow-on for the Aptis contract that they have. It's largely obviously hardware based with workstations, laptop, uh, laptop storage devices and um, that is going to be um, you know sort of a requirement that's not not related to first source that, that uh, where they have uh, other requirements, unique requirements. So that's ongoing. And then their uh, AFCS system, automatic flight control system. Interesting there, it's, it's sort of uh, what DOD would call maybe almost like a little embedded IT, but it's a part of an overall um, H-65 aircraft conversion sustainment project where it's an IT piece. And we anticipate several large business OEMs competing for that. Industry Day was held in November, and we're, uh, we're looking at an RFP release in January or, or I'm sorry, July or August of 2012. Uh, moving on to Secret Service, you'll see a couple uh, there that are uh, very interesting, I think, and, and, um, and going to be very beneficial across our enterprise. One is that I'd like to recognize is the uh, TACCOM. You'll see that there. That is a, uh, a program that we did under a DHS uh, efficiency review program, and it's, it's one of our very successful to date uh, programs in terms of applying our strategic sourcing model. It's going to be a one-year contract with four one-year options, and it will service DHS customers worldwide, uh, DHS-wide. Uh, final review is now going, going on, on on that effort. That will be a very, uh, uh, I think, successful program. And uh, uh, finally, one, uh, the last one for Secret Service is the uh, uh, Information Integration Transformation. Uh, that RFP was released in, in February. Again, a two-step solicitation process under our GSA Alliant, and we're uh, currently in source selection there and looking for a award upcoming. So those are, that's a, a sort of a, a very quick uh, sketch through some opportunities. What I, again, encourage you all to do is to reach out to our uh, industry liaisons. And certainly, if you have any questions around that, certainly MUI can be your first stop. But uh, please do that. And if you have any questions, um, I'm sure they can handle those for you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I'm beginning to think 75 minutes is not enough time for this, but uh, I did want to ask some of the component executives that were kind enough to come here some questions. Uh, and I'll start with Leticia, if I could. So, Mui, if you could give her the microphone. Leticia Henderson is the top procurement executive at Transportation Security Administration. Uh, very recently, you, you issued an RFI asking for industry feedback on program management support services. Just today, TSA has announced an industry day on this. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a feedback in terms of what is TSA looking? Uh, we get a lot of questions about all the RFIs at DHS issues. So what is TSA looking for on this particular one? Sure. Um, for, for this particular requirement, we're doing exactly in line with Dr. Nyack's um, priorities, engaging, engaging in industry. Um, we have uh, Office of Security Capabilities is our office that uh, uh, expends about 1.2 billion of the 2.5 that we do annually, and they do um, all the equipment purchases and integration support services for um, TSA. In that office, there are several. About probably about four years ago, we did an analysis of that portfolio to look at the program management support. Um, that was provided to that office. There were several contracts that were provided in the office and we looked to see if we could find some efficiencies. We went to a more enterprise solution um, for support to that office, which resulted in three major um, contracts that provide support. What we're asking for now, and, and, and RFA describes those, the three major support contracts that support that office. What we're asking for now is interest, to, to take it to the next level, are there more efficiencies that we can gain? Are there more opportunities that we could give a, a come up with a strategy that is more efficient for us? We still see some duplication across 
um, the, the, the three solutions we have, and we're looking for industry to help us kind of frame how we approach the follow-on procurements. Great. Leticia, thank you. I, I don't know if this is a follow-up question, but, and, and we don't have to answer it now, but you know, there would be a question about, well, you know, you're doing an RFI for program management support services. What about Eagle Functional Category 2? What about tabs? You know, it it's always gets to the question of how do all these things interrelate? And, 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 and we, actually, all those things are options. We're, we're asking industry to help us. We're ask, asking for their engagement for, um, again, the, stra the strategies for the follow-ons have not been determined because we want to uh, get consensus and gather your um, ideas about how we approach it. Okay, and great. we're certainly open to all of those. Super, thank you. I have five questions up here, but I'm going to uh, just real quickly, one of the questions, which is easy, is will the slides be available by FC? And the answer is yes. I'll come back to some of the others. But if we could turn to William. William, I, this is probably going to put you in a little bit of a tough spot, but one of the things that we see, uh, you know, DHS is communicating now better than ever, but oftentimes the communication is around major programs that just simply seem to keep slipping to the right, slipping to the right, slipping to the right. Uh, uh, so, in fact, actually, this is the question, actually, I was going to ask for, uh, as Bob, but let me ask you this one. You just did SEVIS too with a very innovative process that I had never seen before, and that is an advisory down select in a pre-RFP mode. Uh, typically, I've seen it post-RFP, but I've never seen it pre-RFP. How is that working for ICE? Is that something you see the department using more and more of? Well, I can't speak for the department, but I know that for ICE, we will definitely be using this uh, much more. Uh, this was an initiative uh, born in uh, and behind Dr. Nyack's uh, d direction on advanced vendor communication. Um, we have, we created a port basically a portfolio of advanced or enhanced vendor engagements. Uh, things that we can do to let industry know exactly what we're looking for. Um, so the advanced <coughs> advisory down select is basically this. We want to get better market research early. We have a lot of stakeholders in this one. First is better market research early for the, uh, for the program office. The earlier we can get information, the better. We like to call it pre-egg information. Before we even birth something, we'd like to get some information, what's the latest and greatest thinking out there. Uh, second is giving vendor feedback early. Uh, we truly believe people get wedded to a solution after they have been in an evaluation or in a selection process or proposal generating process where they've spent a month, 45 days building a proposal and a couple of million dollars engaged in that. They're kind of wedded to a win at that point. They have skin in the game. We'd much rather give some information back, whether you're competitive or non-competitive, and what the universe looks like uh, after a 10-page uh, capability statement, and maybe you've spent a couple thousand dollars uh, in labor building that. Uh, so that, that tends to be one of the benefits. The other benefit is we want to cull the herd early in terms of the best of the best proposals. Our, we have been in situations where we have had uh, the opportunity, and I'll use that word uh, loosely, uh, to evaluate seven, 10, 15 proposals that may take two and three months to get through that process. The return on investment for, for that time spent usually ends up in, uh, while we go and find the best solution we have available, we have a lot of people that have played in that process that would have loved the opportunity to find out earlier in the process that there may have been a lead horse early uh, or a couple lead horses early. Um, and then the last is really about how do we find uh, better solutions for our program offices. And that ends up being, if we ask early and get some feedback, we like to tell people right out of the bat, right out of the gate, uh, are you likely to be in a competitive environment or not likely? That does not mean that you can't play. We don't have the capability to tell you, sorry, you can't play. But we don't want to give you a, a data point to say, hey, maybe there are advanced players in this game, and, let's, and that allows you to make a business decision instead of an emotional one. Great. Well, William, thank you. I, uh, and again, I think I've, there's been a lot of positive industry feedback. I think it's the concept that uh, when an RFP finally goes out, that it's restricted just to those companies will be one that I think is 
uh, hopefully that that works and we can test that out. Bob, now I have the question. Uh, you know, a lot of the procurements within DHS, a lot of communication, a lot of uh, good communication, but unfortunately every procurement seems to get push to the right, push to the right, to the point where there seems to be a lot of paralysis. And very recently, the latest thing is something called balanced workforce assessment. I know you're deeply familiar with it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what is the balanced workforce assessment and what impact has it had on many of the procurements that Tim Shaughnessy just put up from CBP? Well, many of you that I've talked to or have sent me emails have asked about our Campbell's vegetable soup uh, procurements that we have, CISPO, TASPO, PISPO, BIMS, ANTS, EDME, and they all seem to have one common thread, and that is that they are very labor intensive. We are going to have man hours upon man hours that we are going to be soliciting industry for. And many of you have gone to our previous industry days held in August two years ago, and then last February at this particular uh, event where we at CBP told you that things were going to happen. And to our discredit, they didn't happen as quickly as we wanted them to, and we're making strides to make sure that they do happen. One of the areas that is not a problem, but we're having growing pains within CBP because most of our procurements, at least especially in the OIT arena, are old procurements. They were a base plus four option years. We may have bridged those contracts. So some of these contracts have been around for six or seven years, long before the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and the OMB circular came out about the inherently governmental function. We have had to take a strong, strong look at all of these procurements that we have to see exactly how we stack up in relation to that particular requirement. I would hope that many of you, or I would hope that all of you, but at least many of you, go to the Federal Procurement Data System Next Generation to get your information as to what your contract competitors are looking at. As of tomorrow, all of our procurements, well, government-wide, all procurements are going to have to have something identified as to whether or not the procurement will be an inherently governmental function. And our legal shop, General Office of General Counsel, has taken a very strong look at this, and we want to make sure that we are totally in compliance with the rules and regulations. Therefore, there's been a slippage. Is that the only reason there's been a slippage? No, the acquisition strategies, many of you have come in and said, why is it going stars too? Why is it going aligned big business? Why is it not going aligned small business? Acquisition strategies are formulated between the program office and the contracts office. When that decision is made, it goes through several layers until it finally gets approved. When we finally come out with the acquisition strategy, you'll know it because we will have an RFP on the street. We're going to give you the time to come back within your 30, 45 days to respond, and hopefully CBP will be a uh, font of wealth and information for the winning teams here. Bob, thank you. You are an excellent uh, industry liaison. I appreciate it. Listen, folks, we have 10 minutes. I wanted to give Dr. Sims a chance. Uh, Dr. Sims, I'm just curious, how does your office play in, like, and we'll just pick, pick on CBP since Bob was so gracious. How does your office look at those programs, and, and what is, how do you view your role? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I want you guys to write something down. I'm going to share a thought with you. Uh, programs end the way that they start, okay? Uh, we want to make sure that programs start successfully. If you look at the Department of Homeland Security, we have 135 major investments. We consider major our Tier 1, Tier 2 investments, those investments that have an uh, investment life cycle over $300 million. Um, almost every single one of our major investments at the department was in play as the department was being formulated. So that means that we've got, you're talking about old investments, CBP has got some of the oldest, ACE predated DHS. 15 years. Okay, 15 years worth of joy. Um, yes, I do sleep well at night. Um, and, and so it's a complex issue. So, so how are we addressing it? Uh, a number of things. Um, 
an office like mine typically is seen as a compliance office. How do we make sure that, that programs comply with certain kinds of activities? The reality is, is that we need to support programs first and drive compliance second. Uh, if we have a perfectly compliant program but it fails, uh, the operator did not get its capability, and that's what we want to uh, overcome. Uh, PARM, as an organization, Program Accountability and Risk Management, has been working very closely with the uh, Chief Procurement Officer, with the Chief Information Officer of DHS, to streamline our processes. Uh, at DHS, if you go through a typical acquisition life cycle, there are a little over 96 documents that you might have to create that are artifacts, if you will, over the life of the program. Uh, we have taken certain domains, uh, cyber is one of our key domains, and looked at ways to streamline that process. Uh, we've taken those 90 plus documents, gotten those down to a couple dozen, and we feel like those are the most critical value add products for the department. So that's how we, that's how we impact a CBP, for instance, is to help CBP programs find out exactly what needs to be done as opposed to just checking blocks. Um, I just want to leave you with a thought. Uh, PARM is really about, and its primary purpose is about, making sure that we maximize program success and minimize the risk that's inherent in programs. And the degree to which we do that is the degree to which PARM is successful as a new organization. Thank you. Thank you. Again, there's some questions up here. We're not going to get to all of them, but let me ask Dennis Smiley real quickly. Dennis, apparently all these proposals on Eagle 2 expire March 31st. Are you going to come out with uh, an extension if, if the awards are made after March, or, or is that even correct? You, uh... The extension of proposals, we've already went out with the extension for proposals. I mean, an amendment got the, the proposals extended. Okay, so what you're basically saying is that everybody uh, everybody has extended their proposals, and, and, I, and I'll probably suggest to you most people don't know that. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. And I'd like to just turn it back to Dr. Nyack. And before I do, I just want to thank the folks. It's a very strong, visual, uh, compelling uh, argument that every one of the uh, DHS procurement people were willing to come here today. You'll have a chance to talk with them, uh, I guess, after the radio show. But I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nyack for the final word. Yeah. Th thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say three things. I'm going to thank Greg for being the moderator. It's uh, not easy to do that, and he helped us get prepared within all of our busy schedules, so thank you, Greg. Uh, I want to, again, thank everybody here for hanging in there and your interest, and, uh, and especially all of my colleagues who took time to come here today. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, Greg and, and, and everyone here, I wanna, I wanna thank you on, on behalf of FC, on behalf of all of our audience. You know, everyone in the audience doesn't know the whole story behind everything that happens all the time, but you know, uh, this was a pretty creative solution to be able to getting, get you the answers that you needed and to meet the people that you need to meet. And uh, I can't thank Greg enough for coming up with that idea and Nick for you supporting it, you and your, you and your whole team. So we are about to, uh, you know, get your radio voices on and, uh, and get ready because Mr. Fleisig is going to come in here shortly with, uh, with a great lineup of folks. Uh, going to be a, a live radio show for uh, Federal News Radio.